Uh, okay. Um, I guess uh, I, I won't say any more other than um, I'm delighted that our colleagues in Indonesia and Malaysia will work with us to trial the concept in our region. Air Services has gone to the service providers in both countries. Uh, they're very excited about it. They've agreed in principle, uh, but once we are ready, probably um, in, in about two weeks' time, we'll then go and talk to them as to how we extend uh, the trial uh, to them. And uh, I think that's, that's going to be great for all of us. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge the, uh, the great work uh, of Air Services uh, in delivering uh, this, uh, this trial. Um, obviously, um, we're also indebted to uh, Qantas, Virgin and Inmarsat, uh, without who uh, this trial wouldn't have been possible. Thank you. You've indicated that... Uh, well, perhaps, can we just quickly show the video? It's, it's less than a minute and it'll give you a, a really good uh, impression of what's happening. Mm. While aircraft are flying high over oceanic airspace outside of conventional radar coverage, the aircraft tracking trial will use Inmarsat satellites to communicate with air traffic controllers. A data package containing the aircraft's exact position, airspeed, altitude and heading is transmitted every 15 minutes to an orbiting satellite. The satellite's receiver antenna picks up the signal and then rebroadcasts the data down to the nearest ground receiver station. Once the signal is captured by the ground station, it is then sent by land-based fibre optic cabling to air services, air traffic services centres or to other air traffic control centres in our region. On arrival at the air traffic control facility, the data is used to update the aircraft's information on the radar screen for the controller. Right, any questions? <laughs> uh, you've indicated that you went to the 15 minute interval because that's ICAO recommendation, but if the equipment is fully automated, what's the argument for not going continuous, uh, real time, uh, and constant? Well, uh, I think one of the key issues is the cost. There is a cost associated with each connection and, and obviously it would be substantially more costly to do it um, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, on, on full time for every aircraft in the skies at the time. And I think you may also end up with a bit of information overload and clutter. But, uh, that, and, and that may therefore reduce the effectiveness and, and the immediate response capabilities to, uh, to, to some irregularity. Mm. Can, I, can but, I just add to that? Uh, I mean, if there is an aircraft that is experiencing some sort of problem, it will become uh, evident very quickly in terms of a, a deviation. And the system just cracks in automatically and focuses on that. And, um, to, to, a, to an extent, it's not necessary to track all of the aircraft continuously all of the time because of uh, that feature of the, uh, the system as it's uh, intended to be implemented. So had this system been working fully last March over the area, uh, it, it, throughout uh, Southeast Asia or throughout the trial areas, how closely would we have known where MH370 came down? Um, well, we, we, clearly within minutes. Uh, as uh, Angus said earlier, the last track, the last um, pinpointed uh, location uh, for that aircraft was in the Straits of Malacca. So that's why the search was there for such a long time. And it was only when later satellite data was interrogated that it was possible to move the site uh, a, long, a long way away. Now, had this system been in place, then there would have been a, a ping uh, from the from the aircraft, firstly there'd been con there would have been continuous um, uh, connections, and so the fact that it had changed course would have been immediately known. Now I appreciate that it would have been very difficult. One would imagine, without knowing what uh, precisely occurred in the case of MH370, to have intervened from outside, but at least it would have tracked the aircraft um, to, to within 15 minutes of, uh, and, and, and done so simultaneously. The big difference was it wouldn't have taken us weeks to interpret the data and to find then where the engines finally stopped. And the 15 minutes presumably would have triggered the heightened level of 
surveillance over the play. Well, it would have been triggered seven hours earlier when it changed direction. And, mm. and so you, you, think, you think in all likelihood you would have uh, monitored MH370 where and when it crashed? Well, I, I, think, I think we've got to be very, very careful because uh, you can turn this system off. Uh, so the system, what would have happened uh, while the system was operating, um, we'd know exactly where the aircraft was. But if somebody had turned the system off, we were in the same set of circumstances as we've experienced, uh, you know, on the latter part of the, uh, the flight of uh, MH370. Is there, a, is, there an argument, is, there, is there an argument, though, that it should never be able to be turned off? Um, well, this, this is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the arguments that is put forward is if there is a, uh, an electrical problem uh, which results in smoke or, uh, or even worse, fire, you need to be able to isolate uh, the electrical, electrical systems that uh, are affected. Uh, so this is something that needs to be uh, looked at and discussed um, very carefully before any you know, decisions are made. Um, if it had operated as intended, is it your belief that the, the aircraft could have been recovered? Well, I think as the Deputy Prime Minister has said, um, essentially if this system had uh, remained operative um, on, the, uh, on any aircraft, let's, let's talk about any aircraft. If the system is operative on any aircraft, um, we're going to know um, quite precisely uh, where it ran into trouble and that would be the starting point for any subsequent search and rescue uh, activity. Uh, and I think you're much better off uh, if you've got uh, a last known position uh, that is within minutes of where the aircraft disappeared uh, than the circumstances we have with 370 where the last known position is several hours flying time uh, away from where the aircraft probably ended up. And one further factor, um, it, it was very helpful in finding the Air France aircraft that there was debris still floating on the um, surface at the time the searchers got to that location. We didn't get to the right location until well after any debris would have, soak, uh, would have sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so in reality, getting an early um, uh, or more up-to-date positioning, uh, if we had even got early advice that the, the aircraft had so significantly changed course, uh, we wouldn't have lost those early weeks um, searching in the wrong place. Uh, am I right to say the technology to achieve this is, uh, I think you suggested on 737s and 747s, it's clearly quite old technology. Um, so the capacity has been there to do it for a number of years, fair comment? It, it, it's not on 737s, uh, but it's on the wide-bodied aircraft, uh, as Angus said, the 747-400 series, which has been around for a, a long time, that's true. So there, there has been some capability, although this is a relatively new satellite too, isn't it? So uh, whether all of the, uh, the pieces were in place um, is, it would, would require a bit further research. But having said that, uh, I think public awareness of the significance of being able to track aircraft more precisely over oceanic areas has heightened and that's led to a focus on what we might be able to do to, to better, to, to better uh, uh, keep monitor aircraft uh, all the time. Was this system available on MH370? And uh, y yes, yes the, uh, the fans equipment uh, was on. Um, it's a 777. Uh, it's on all 77s. Uh, it's on uh, 330s. It's on every uh, wide-bodied aircraft after uh, the Boeing 747-400. So it's not on, for example, the old classic uh, 747s, uh, but it is on all modern wide-bodied aircraft. It is not normally on the narrow-bodied uh, aircraft like a, a 737. So um, it's, uh, it's a system, um, it's, uh, again, fans, um, future air navigation uh, systems. Um, it is a system that uh, Qantas have used to track their aircraft uh, over oceanic areas um, 
for a number of years. We, we have been tracking Qantas aircraft for a number of years with uh, data link messages back uh, every 30 to 40 minutes. What's different about this is we're bringing down um, the reporting to 15, less, up to 15 minutes. I think in, in actual fact we'll be uh, having reports every 14 minutes. Uh, and this, this means, and with this facility, to be able to uh, uh, go down to uh, five minutes or less when there's a deviation obviously means uh, that we're going to be uh, uh, in a much better position not only to track the aircraft but if something goes wrong uh, to provide the necessary information to the search and rescue authority as to where the best place to start the search is. Is there something that's 